Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Leah. I am a co-op student on the teaching and learning team at Western Libraries. And today I'll be talking to you about how I use the ethics of care to develop an asynchronous online library module. So the background for this, the goal of this project was to develop an asynchronous library orientation module for incoming first year undergraduate students. It was offered widely to students from any program or faculty as part of a larger student experience, student experience initiative. And while I think the main audience was students coming from high school, realistically, they could have been coming from any educational background. This program was offered to these students in August before they started their first year uh, as sort of a way to bridge the gap into university. So because of this, because it was completely voluntary and taking place during their summer break, I didn't want to develop a very long and onerous module, so I aimed for about 30 to 60 minutes worth of content. So this is where I was approaching it from as an educator. Uh, feminist pedagogy, for those of you who may be unfamiliar, this quote sums it up somewhat nicely. Feminist pedagogy is not interested in having an authoritarian teacher dominate the classroom without any collaboration with students. Some key points is that learners should be participants in their own education with agency, and that learning is impacted by lived experiences, meaning that you can deliver the same lesson to a group of people and they will all take from it different things depending on where they're coming from. The ethics of care as a concept exists separately from pedagogy, but within the context of feminist pedagogy, a caring relation is clearly enacted between two people, the carer, in this case, the teacher, and the cared for, in this case, the student. So within the ethics of care, the carer, the teacher, should be responding to the needs of the cared for or the learners. And then the other aspect of that is that learners should be receiving the results of that attention, meaning it has to be a willing exchange, um, but often that would be on the level of individual attention for each learner. So with that background, uh, these are some of the challenges I encountered in applying feminist pedagogy and the ethics of care in this particular context. Some questions I ran into, how do we build connection without personal contact? How do we allow room for the vast range of possible learner experiences? And how do we provide individual attention and participation without really knowing our learners. Uh, and if we think about this in sort of comparable contexts, for example, an asynchronous course that's, over, that's offered over an entire term, in that case, the instructor has the opportunity to interact with their students, maybe through forum posts, other types of interaction, maybe office hours. And also they have the opportunity to adapt their course content depending on their learner needs as they progress through the term. The other comparable context would be uh, any library one-shot that could be delivered synchronously online or in person. In that context, even though it's only a one-shot, the instructor still has the opportunity to speak to their students at the beginning of the lesson, maybe check and see what students want to get out of the lesson and then adapt accordingly. In this context, we don't have any of that opportunity. It's completely asynchronous and we never meet face to face. So how do we address these particular concerns? It was a real struggle for me. Um, but these are some key points that I found helped guide me uh, in, in addressing those challenges. First, by identifying what incoming students need to know now, I was first of all able to manage some of my own feelings of overwhelm trying to introduce students to everything about the library. But the main point of this is that I should and could have been attending to the needs of the learners, that this is what I ended up doing. There's a lot that I wanted to tell students about the library, a lot that I thought they needed to know, but I had to flip my perspective around and think about from the student's perspective before they've even gotten to school and they've got a lot of other stuff going on before their first year, what do they need to know? So this was a way of me honoring that aspect of the ethics of care, attending to the needs of the learner. Next, I considered how their lived experiences would impact their interactions with the library. Um, my colleagues helped me by highlighting that academia and academic libraries are very unique cultures in and of themselves. So even though I couldn't speak to my learners and find out what their individual contexts were and adapt the lesson accordingly, I was able to approach it from the perspective that a lot of them probably have never encountered this culture of academia before. And even for those that have, Western might be different or it might have changed since the last time they interacted in a higher education type setting. So by approaching it that way, rather than having to consider every possible life experience my learners might have, 
I was able to focus on what I know about the culture of academia and speak to the learners from that perspective. Here's something you might not know, for example. And finally, to present these four categories without overwhelming my learners, because again, it's about what they need to know. And what they definitely don't need is to be completely overwhelmed with information about the library. Uh, I first had to have a good understanding of what students could expect to find at the library as they progress throughout their degree. That way I was able to set them up with the knowledge that they needed to find the services that they would need later on without going into crazy in-depth detail about all of it all at once. So this is just a snapshot of the main page of the module in the end. Uh, we chose a lot of very deliberate language. We were asking questions, talking about what the library does rather than telling learners what they should be doing with this information. So we've got our four major sections, library spaces, library collections, research, and getting support. Those are what we identified as sort of started from the main functions of an academic library and then broke it down into more digestible chunks. You'll also notice this fifth section of reflect. Now, reflection was the main way that I actually assessed this module in the end. Of course, assessing learning is really important and assessing the effect efficacy of the module is really important. But it wasn't going to work in this context to just use quizzes, for example. It's not helpful if they know how to name the five different library locations when they can just look that information up online. Uh, instead, I included reflection questions along the way, like, have you visited other libraries before? And how might a public library be different from an academic library? And the section at the end is where learners were asked to consider if their knowledge of the library had changed and what else they might still want to know. In doing this, my hope is that the learners will build connections between their own past experiences and this new experience in academia, and that they'll feel encouraged to seek out the information that they need on their own. Because unlike a four credit course, this is purely for their own benefit. My hope was that they would actually build those connections. And I was still trying to respect what they already knew. So one thing that I learned through this process and that I think is a really key takeaway is that a caring relation is not a one and done sort of thing. The first point of contact does not define how the entire relation will unfold. In this case, this module is only the start of the relationship that students will develop with the library. All of these factors here, interactions with staff, use of space, availability of resources, and this module will impact the student's experience and their relationship with the library. So I had to build that in in some way and to do justice to this. I worked with other library units to understand how they saw students interacting with the library or what they wanted students to know. Because if this is to be the start of a caring relation, then I can't be telling students information that conflicts with what they will actually ultimately find in the library. Further, I found it was really important to present a lot of options and not instructions. Again, respecting learners' experiences rather than saying you have to do this, this, and this to be successful. I focused on if you need this type of support, here's how to find it. Here's when you might need these resources. Ultimately, no matter what, I can only control what is in this module and hope that it sets the stage for a positive and caring relation going forward. But I can't control the other circumstances in which students will interact with the library. I can only control my little corner here. So the end result of this project is a module focused on presenting the learners with as many different ways to connect with us as possible without overwhelming them with information. Hopefully they will seek out the library proactively rather than waiting until we come to their classrooms or maybe not ever using the library throughout their undergraduate degree. I really hope that their other interactions with the library reinforce this ethic of care, um, but at the very least, hopefully we're getting them off to a good start. Thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Welcome to my showcase session, Mind the Gap, Bridging to OERs Through the Use of AERs. I'm Lauren Bordage. By profession, I am a copyright specialist who serves the needs of students and faculty members at Wilfrid Laurier University. I make course readings available affordably and accessibly, and that work is what brings me here today. My goal is to reframe how you think about your library's electronic course reserves, to get you into a mindset to harness the service and market it as a source of affordable educational resources. AERs. This can help your efforts to get more faculty members to embrace open by bridging the gap between proprietary and open materials. 
I come to you today as a queer, white, cisgendered woman of settler colonial descent, living and working on the Haldeman Tract, the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Laurier's Brantford campus is situated near the largest First Nations reserve in Canada, the Six Nations of the Grand River. I want to take a moment to acknowledge my aforementioned settler colonial roots and say that I respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, and acknowledge that it's on those of us coming from places of privilege to break down the systemic barriers that our FNMI community members continue to face. Barriers like affordable access to education. When people hear the term AER for the first time, the first thing they think of is low cost textbook options. That's not wrong. Lower cost proprietary textbook purchases or rentals are a type of AER, but that's just it. They are a type. Any educational material that is free or low cost can be considered an AER. This includes the aforementioned traditionally published materials, but it also includes individual book chapters, journal articles, and pretty much anything that can be freely freely found or openly licensed on the internet. AER is a very, very large umbrella. So let's talk about how proprietary and open can be brought closer together through AERs. On the one end of the poll, you have proprietary. This is primarily attributed to traditionally published textbooks. It's also case studies like those from Harvard and Ivy where the only real way to get them is by buying them directly from the publisher. Supplementary materials like test banks, problem sets, and other activities which can only be accessed through purchase digital codes or another type. These tend to be the sorts of things you'll notice you even struggle to be able to buy for your library's collection. Then at the other end, we have open. Open educational materials are primarily thought of through the lens of OERs, which are most commonly seen as openly published textbooks and supplementary material that mirror their proprietary counterparts. They can include anything that is both openly licensed and used for educational purposes, however. Video series like the University of Alberta's Opening Copyright Project and any open access journal articles or books are great examples. This can even just be as simple as openly licensed images. And then in the middle, bridging the gap, you have affordable materials. They can be anything that just lowers the direct cost to students, such as cheaper prices on textbooks or rental options, which come with their own series of pitfalls. However, they are also much more powerful than that because they can include anything that redirects the cost away from the student and onto the educational institution. Anything that the library can purchase or license in some way has the power to be used as an affordable educational resource. Anything freely available on the web also counts. This even gives you the power to take pieces of proprietary materials and turn them into more affordable options. So I liken the relationship between AERs and OERs to the math analogy about how all squares are rectangles, even though all rectangles are not squares. All OERs are affordable because they're open, but as we saw in the previous Venn diagram, not all AERs are openly licensed. That's one of the things that makes AERs the perfect bridge towards increasing the use of OERs on your campus. AERs can go where open can't. They can get you access to material that is only ever going to be published and sold traditionally. OERs need AERs to be more powerful pedagogical tools. The other benefit of this overlap is that you can help soothe fears and reluctance in those instructors who stubbornly hold on to the belief that OERs are of lesser quality or scholarly merit just by nature of being open. AERs and OERs matter because affordability is a huge barrier to access in higher education and course materials have become more of a burden over time. We've seen that come up a lot over the last several years as we hear more and more about textbook affordability surveys happening. The current cost of living crisis that we're seeing exacerbates this sort of thing. AERs and OERs are not easy for instructors and that's why so many of them hesitate to make the switch because it's more work for them but they're not thinking about how much affordability matters to their students. If we can show them an easier way to make the transition by reframing the discussion through a lens they already know, then we can get them to focus on eliminating the affordability barrier to improve student learning outcomes. 
So focusing specifically on e-learning, since that's the whole point of this conference, it's not just about affordability. The primary reason that AERs and OERs matter for e-learning is accessibility. And I mean both kinds of accessibility. Online students are disadvantaged when e-learning courses only use print materials. They're often forced into buying them because they can't necessarily access their campus to get a library copy. The cost of those digital textbook options and the fact that rentals, which disappear at the end of a term, are becoming much more common in university and college bookstores presents another barrier to access. AERs and OERs don't present this problem because they're available digitally and they're downloadable or otherwise savable so that students can refer to them beyond the last day of a course. A lot of proprietary resources also tend to be a lot less formally accessible for students with disabilities. That problem isn't completely solved with AERs and OERs, but those working in the field are always considering how they can make their materials more accessible to those with different needs. Obviously, AERs need a place to live. There are different models for this. Some institutions allow instructors to upload whatever they want to the learning management system. Others will create their own custom course readers. I like the option of using infrastructure that's already in place on most, if not all, college and university library sites. The course reserves platform. E-reserves are a phenomenon that have been growing over the last 13 years. We started using them in 2009 at Laurier. Uh, many instructors have an understanding that course reserves exist as a bare minimum. So if we can reframe the conversations we're having around course reserves to talk more about them as AERs, the course reserves infrastructure becomes the perfect platform for housing these resources. And the best part is the service itself comes with subject matter experts that you can use as your allies. You probably haven't thought of them that way before. Many of them probably haven't even thought of themselves as doing that type of work, but they are. So do the most organic thing possible and use what already exists in your library. Last up, I just wanna give you some examples of the types of items that are, can be considered AERs. Uh, these are the most common ones that we host in the Laurier E-Reserve system. So books, multi-user or unlimited simultaneous e user ebooks are the most affordable educational material you can offer when it comes to providing textbooks. Single user ebooks can still be better than not offering anything, especially for online learning courses. By providing e-textbooks where we can, we're helping students save the cost of marked up bookstore purchases or rentals. And then there's book chapters. Thanks to fair dealing guidelines, you can make chapters available as accessible PDFs for students. This is another place where your library's copyright and course reserves team can really help you with this. It keeps instructors from assigning optional books where they might only need students to refer to a few chapters. It's also really powerful for customizing a course. And that's the same with journal articles. The primary reason to encourage them is for the customizability and they tend to be covered by subscription licenses or open access licenses and then on the off chance that either of those things is true your fair dealing guidelines can probably still help you so the next type is uh, audio and visual streaming material when whether they're library licensed or through a third party provider such as the CBC or YouTube, streaming media content is a great affordable way to supplement the course content. Uh, we often host links to both streaming video files and more and more often lately podcast episodes as well. Uh, things like TED Talks and CBC content, uh, New York Times, even stuff from PBS. The other major source of supplementary affordable educational content that we host in our system is uh, links to both live and archived web content, whether textual or interactive, there's a lot less, or sorry, there's a lot more educational content freely or openly available on the internet these days for instructors and students to interact with. Um, by managing the course reserve system, when someone reports a broken link or a page no longer being present, we can use the internet archives way back machine to uh, ensure we have stable continued access to web-based AERs. So overall, the great news here is that unlike an open education or OER publishing program, you shouldn't need anything special to provide affordable educational resources for your faculty members. If you're already doing electronic course reserves, you're on your way. All you need to do is change the way you talk about and market that service. Helping people understand and reframe the work that is already happening in the library as open educational work goes a long way to getting faculty on board. The goal of every university should be to get as many courses as possible switched to OERs, but since we know that's not possible, we need to make sure that we're using language that shows that the library is already on top of filling the gap between proprietary and open.
Hello, and welcome to our e-learning showcase entitled Dream It, Build It, and Then What? Creating a Notion Database for Sustaining Online Learning Objects. My name is Emily Hector, and I'm Liaison Librarian Education at the OISE Library, University of Toronto Libraries. And my name is Kaushir Mahataji, and I'm a graduate student library assistant at OISE Library and a PhD student at the Faculty of Information. Today, we're going to be presenting about a new strategy we've developed for managing a suite of online learning objects, which we hope will be useful to those of you who are also managing similar collections of asynchronous instructional resources. Here's what we'll be covering today. So we'll start by describing the situation in which we found ourselves and the reasons why we knew it was imperative to build a solution. Then we'll provide details on the tool that we chose to address our needs and what the answer to our challenge actually looks like in practice so far. So for context, like many of you, the OISE Library responded to a shift to remote teaching by substituting or supplementing our synchronous instruction, which had been previously our primary delivery method, with asynchronous resources. Over the course of 2020 and 2021, we created a number of standalone resources on information literacy topics, such as video tutorials and H5P activities that could be used on demand. We also crafted a series of self-paced learning modules that integrated these videos and activities with explanatory text and assessment tools to holistically guide users through the fundamentals of literature searching in a self-paced manner. Within just a few years of working on these projects, we had generated over 30 learning objects of various formats. These new learning objects uh, quickly became important components of our instructional program as we used them to bolster our Zoom instruction with pre-work opportunities, provide another touch point for students we might not meet in class, and offer up self-serve reference, reference materials when needed. However, we soon, soon learned that these objects, despite their utility, also provided us with a new challenge, keeping them consistently up to date. Even within the first year of creating and distributing these resources, we experienced changes in our library system, public health circumstances, and library policies, changes that needed to be reflected in our online learning objects in order for them to remain useful and accurate. In particular, changes to the U of T library website, database interfaces, and citation managers created visual inconsistencies with our existing content. Additionally, our public health precautions were gradually phased out, leaving our learning objects with inaccurate leftover information about library closures and reduced services. In addition to the challenge of keeping information up to date, the collaborative authorship and ownership of these resources added complexity to the task of managing them over the long term. All of these objects were developed in collaboration with, between me and several different graduate student library assistants over the course of over two years. All of these original files, whether those be H5P files, audio or video tracks, subtitle tracks, PDFs, Articularize or Canvas courses, were housed in a variety of locations with different permissions attached. This made it extra difficult to understand what lived where and what revisions needed to occur. As inconsistencies began to emerge, we addressed these changes in an ad hoc way by shadowing outdated resources so they weren't discoverable or revising materials when we had the opportunity. We came to realize that these changes and updates are ever ongoing and that we required more transparency and infrastructure to sustain these items over the long term. So we asked ourselves, how do we maintain these objects over the long term, given their diverse format types, the wide ranging content and our limited staff capacity? We decided on Notion to create our infrastructure. Notion is a project management tool and note-taking tool, which is sometimes referred to as productivity software. We focused on its database feature, though notice that the tool offers additional functionality that ranges from wiki creation to website development. Notion allows users to build centralized databases, which can be updated regularly by multiple collaborators, including our student employees and librarians. Similar to Google Docs and Google Sheets, Notion provides a shareable link for collaborators with customizable permissions from view only to edit. Collaborators, after creating an account with Notion using email, their Google account, or their iCloud account, 
are redirected to the shared Notion database. The database itself is user-friendly, easy to navigate, and encompasses various property types, including date, URL, and text, which we found to be useful for describing and checking on our learning objects. While Notion met our requirements as a database tool, we recognize that the free version of Notion is limited to five collaborators. Notion is also a cloud-based app that doesn't offer an offline mode. To address these needs that Emily described earlier, we moved forward with creating the Notion database. The database facilitates collaboration between the two of us, and thinking ahead will be easily shareable with new student library employees and librarians who take on instructional responsibilities. We've prioritized the ability to sort the objects by a variety of characteristics, such as format and location, to streamline our workflows. We've also focused on transparently documenting needed updates before actually making them, populating columns such as review status, date of last review, last reviewed by, and updates needed. This way, the work of reviewing objects and implementing those changes can be undertaken by multiple team members over a longer period of time. This is a fairly new project for us. We just developed this database in fall 2022, and we know it will con continue to evolve in the months and years to come. However, so far, we're happy with the flexibility, usability, and most importantly, the accountability that this provides us. And we hope it will help us sustain these valuable teaching tools over the long term. Thank you so much for your time and attention today, and we welcome questions and for you to get in touch with us via email. Take care.